The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. The world's expert in uh, understanding wavelengths. And, and so on. <laughs> Uh, no, he's been he's been he's been a collaborator with our group, and he's done a lot of work in the space. Uh, he's built all kinds of interesting cameras, also compressive sensing, and now he's working for an organization called MITRE. M I T R E. Correct. Um, and he's going to tell us. He did this really beautiful study of different ways of capturing different way, uh, of capturing multispectral images. So he's uh, very delighted to have him here. He's going to tell us. Okay, so um, by, by way of introduction, I'm going to talk about this in a moment, but uh, it's an interesting thing. I think in this uh, computational photography or computational imaging community, I think it's a new enough discipline that very, very few people actually study it. Um, most of the people who have come to this community have come either from a computer vision or graphics or, or other sort of computer uh, background, and others have come from sort of the optics y, physics -y background. And I've come from the other side of it, which, which may shine through in some of the things that I, I say to you today. Uh, so I'm going to talk in general about uh, this spectral imaging. Uh, and I, this is a talk that I put together not exactly for a group like this. So it's a little bit short on introductory slides. It kind of just dives right in. So I'm going to chat for a moment. Um, and I'm also going to talk uh, a, a little bit, uh, these guys provided me some background slides since you guys haven't talked about uh, tomography yet, which is going to come up at, at some point in my talk. So this is going to be a little disjointed, but consider this background before I get into, uh, into the body of the talk uh, overall. So um, some of the, the techniques that I'm going to talk about rely on uh, tomography, which most likely everybody has heard about. Uh, like a, that's the, the T in a, a CAT scan or CT scan. Uh, it's also a major part of how MRI scans work. And the basic idea behind tomography is that you, uh, you take a measurement uh, where you're integrating something uh, along uh, a path through some object. And then you measure, for example, the intensity of these things. So you you end up with this uh, basically line integrals through this thing of, of some property. In this case, it's the effectively the density of an object. Uh, and then you measure that at the bottom on the other side. You do that for a bunch of different angles as you rotate your source and your detector around the object. Uh, and from that, as we'll talk about in a minute, uh, you can reconstruct the the, the object that you're interested in. Now, this slide is just demonstrating that there are a few different geometries for doing this. In, in one case, you have uh, this, this parallel beam tomography. Uh, in other cases, you have this uh, fan beam tomography. That is, to a large extent, uh, a choice made purely on the convenience of your of your physical system. So, for example, here, if, if you are if your beams are X-rays or something, then generating a whole bunch of parallel X-rays is kind of a pain. Uh, whereas generating a, creating a point source of x-rays that just go off radially and then you detect over here, that's, that's quite a bit easier. So you just have some rearranging of rays to deal with on the other, but, that, but that's the basic idea. So go ahead and go two slides forward. Uh, well, no, that's the, 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 the second one is fun, so let's go do that. Um, so, so here's an example of uh, looking at the computed tomography for... Uh, or a head, apparently. Uh, so this is the density function. And if you look at the, the parallel beam projections, uh, <coughs> this, this is mathematically, this is called a radon transform. But if you look, this is a, the angle uh, that the parallel beams are going through the head, in this case. Uh, and this axis is which of those many parallel beams uh, you're looking at. So uh, you see this... It's really hard to describe without some familiarity with this problem, but uh, this is the, the sort of pattern that you get. And basically, there is enough information here to reconstruct this. So you can think of each vertical slice as one image taken from as, each direction. As one, yeah, so, so for example, if you were, 
if you were to just take a standard x-ray, like, like you're sort of looking at here, like your doctor puts up on the wall, uh, if a vertical slice is a 1D version of that sort of x-ray, right? So you take that same kind of x-ray, but looking through in a whole bunch of different directions, and this is what you get. Um, the same thing here, except that they're just kind of rearranged a little bit. Instead of a vertical slice now, it's sort of a curved surface is that normal thing. That is, you get all of the same parallel rays, they just don't happen all at the same time anymore. <coughs> on to the next one now. Uh, so now the question is, how do you turn this back into, uh, uh, into the image that you're looking for? And as it turns out, basically the, uh, and, and it's been a while since I thought about this, so I might get the details wrong. Feel free to help me out here if I screw this up. So if you are uh, projecting through this way, then that vertical slice is what you get for a single angle, and that vertical slice basically is a line through the 2D Fourier transform of your image. Okay, So you take all of those vertical slices, and instead of plotting them as a nice rectangular thing, you take each one and lay it out at the angle it was taken, and uh, it's going to give you an estimate of the Fourier transform of your object, except you're going to have samples along these radial lines based on how you scanned. All right. Maybe so, you can draw it quickly. Yeah, that's a very good Probably idea. Thank you. I, I, I can. I can. See that here. Yeah, I can do that. Thank you. Uh, so, so here's my here's my Fourier space. Here's my uh, physical space. All right. I start out with my parallel rays. I measure the result with my detector over here, and that tells me the Fourier transform. So this is a 2D Fourier transform. And I now know the Fourier transform sampled along that line. Okay? So now I do it again in this direction, and now I know the 2D Fourier transform here. All right? That's great. So one might only slightly naively think that, hey, if I know the Fourier transform of this thing, then I know the thing itself. All i got to do is Fourier transform back. All right? That's almost completely true, except that you realize that the, the pattern you have this thing Fourier transformed in is not a rectangular grid. So you can't just pop it into your standard 2D Fourier transform algorithm and, and get the, the Fourier transform back. Or the, the, the direct function back. Uh, there are lots of crazy interpolation problems, and it gets a little bit ugly. So uh, there's a, I don't know if you have, yeah, so there is, I'm not going to talk about how it works, but there is this uh, other algorithm that's very popular for this sort of thing called filtered back projection. Really, it, it, it messes with where you do the interpolation, uh, and in general, it gets past a lot of the artifacts that you would otherwise see. The, the, the bottom line, the thing to take away from this little uh, pre-talk talk uh, is, is the basic concept of tomography. That is, you, you perform uh, integrals through some object uh, from a bunch of different angles, and then it gives you all you need to know in order to figure out the full structure of the object itself. All right, is that clear? Any questions? So X-ray tomography, you have you put the X-ray with mm -hmm. the sensor take multiple projections from that you can figure out what's inside. And we're going to use that same exact principle now to think about wavelength. Yeah. We're going to stop looking at heads and look at <coughs> data cubes. Go ahead. Uh, so you have some kind of object that's spherically symmetrical, but uh, if you cut it, it actually has different layers. How do you get the layers out? How do you mean it's spherically symmetrical? Uh, so let's say the density or whatever you're measuring is exactly the same for every direction, but internally is actually heterogeneous instead of like homogeneous. Like the hair. Well, that's not perfectly spherical. Hey, do you, so, so for, are you yeah. saying like it's got layers? Yeah, but like perfectly symmetrical layers. Like okay, a circle inside so, a circle inside. Oh, concept, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so a, a spherical shell of glass, a spherical shell of metal, like that. Yeah. Built up. Uh, that's not, that's, a that's not a problem because uh, what so so what what you're telling me, I mean what you're suggesting that might be a problem is that 
every measurement you take, every image that you take, is going to look exactly the oh, same, wait. right? I get it now. Okay. But the object really does look exactly the same from every direction, so that's okay. Okay. <coughs> but that's a, that, that's a good way of thinking about yeah. these problems. Because yeah, absolutely. Because if it looks the same from the, every side, then in the, in the traditional camera, it must be a sphere. Right. But in the X-ray tomography or tomography in general, if it looks the same from every projection, then it must be spherically concentric. Right. Right. I'm a big fan of symmetry. Arguments. <laughs> okay, so, so so this talk is basically a comparison. Uh, it, it was put together for a customer who wanted sort of a survey of hyperspectral imaging techniques and the trade-offs between them. Um, so there, there's not a whole lot of intro here, but uh, so what we're trying to do, uh, I'm going to talk about a data cube, right, which is X, Y, and lambda. And we've got some resolution in, in all three of those. In general, I'm just going to call that N, NX, NY, and L, so the number of uh, resolution elements in lambda. Um, what else was I going to say? Yeah, okay, uh, that, that, that's a reasonable introduction. Uh, so <coughs> these are all... I don't think any of these are, well, some of these have sort of become commercial products, but these are all basically research uh, level uh, devices, um, nominally looking at the same thing, except for the last couple, uh, one of which is Ramesh's uh, and uh, Rockets, and the other one uh, is, uh, uh, all, well, it doesn't matter where it's coming from, but it, it's uh, another one that's not exactly uh, a spectral imager. Uh, one, one more thing by way of uh, terminology. Uh, spectral imager means you get some spectral channels, a few, five, ten. Uh, multispectral generally means you get a bunch, dozens. Hyperspectral generally means you get like a thousand. So I tend to be very sloppy with those terms, but you know, that's really all it means. And some people make multispectral as visible. And have perspectral as going outside visible. That's that's right. People use so, all kinds so, of different terminology. You know, yeah. So I, I, I basically I'm just copying to the fact that I'm as sloppy with these terms as everybody else. Is. <laughs> uh, okay, so go, go ahead. We'll we'll uh, get started. So the, the the points of comparison that I'm going to talk about here uh, are are the data volume uh, of the the scene that we're looking at. For almost all of these, this is going to be n x times n y times l, the number of spectral channels. Um, the physical volume, just how big is the physical device, uh, the architectural impact on acquisition time. Some of these are devices that you point at something, push a button, and you know, everything's acquired in, in an instant. Other things have to be scanned. Um, the, another one is the computational reconstruction and scaling. Uh, you guys are pretty comfy at this point that sometimes data has to be processed after you acquire it. Uh, the, the photon efficiency, this is sort of a big one that, that uh, Pramesh was alluding to earlier, that in a lot of these devices, you end up throwing away a lot of light that actually comes through your, your aperture, uh, but never gets used. And then compression is an interesting one. Have you guys talked about compressive sensing at all? No, not yet. Okay, so compressive sensing is this, basically the idea that if I'm trying to measure a data volume, nx times ny times l, uh, I might take some number of measurements that is smaller than that. Uh, and based on some assumptions about the space, uh, I, I might try to reconstruct that full data volume. Uh, there might be artifacts involved, but, but that's the general idea. Uh, so a couple of caveats. Uh, some of these quantities are basically rough, and uh, the, the, I'm not talking about the data quality here because that's very, very dependent on the specific device and the, and the way that you operate it. All right. First and easiest by way of introduction is uh, the, this what we're calling a, a baseline camera where we, you just have a scanning filter. Um, and this is one that uh, Anke talked about earlier as well. Uh, you just have a lens. You're imaging a scene onto a sensor, but before you do that, you have some tunable wavelength filter in place. And so just to sort of get you familiar with the, uh, the language that I'm going to be using, D Datacube in this case really is... Uh, the this, this standard thing, the volume is basically just however big your lens is and whatever its focal length is. Uh, acquisition time, the impact here is that you have to scan this filter. So you have to you know, point the camera at a scene and scan the filter and, and wait while that happens. Photon efficiency here is probably one of the more relevant uh, or more interesting points. And this is what Ramesh was talking about earlier. It's 1 over L. 
Right? When you're talking about visible light, 1 over 3 doesn't seem like such a big deal. 1 over 1,000, that becomes a problem. Right? You may want to explain how the tunable filter works. Um, or, or what it does. Yeah, so, so the tunable, so, so um, <coughs> as Anke was talking about here, this might be a, a color wheel. So this might be a wheel that, that has different uh, parts of it with different spectral filters. And each of the spectral filters in a, in a uh, device like this is going to be a notch filter, effectively. It's going to block everything but some narrow range, you know, maybe 5, 10, 20 nanometers. Uh, or it could, there are... I don't even know how to describe them. Uh, Cavity-based uh, tunable filters mm -hmm. that are electrically tunable, so they got no real moving parts uh, exactly. Right. But you can dial in the, the filter. Uh, it, it can change the, its color response yeah. by usually changing the distance between the plates. And if the, the soap bubbles are floating, you'll realize that depending on the thickness of the bubble, it has a different color also. Right. Uh, or if you spill oil on top of water, and that depending on the thickness of the oil water layer, oh, there you go. Yeah, uh, so, but by way of analogy, if any time you've, you've got uh, uh, these two layers, you, you're creating a cavity, which sort of acts like a, a, a filter. Um, and you can think of that as sort of, this is a loose analogy, don't take this too literally, as like a, in the electronic domain, a, you know, a single pole filter, right? You can add additional layers and you get to something like a Bragg grating, if that sounds familiar to you guys, or a multi-layer dielectric stack, if that, that term works better, where you, you can get uh, even sharper cutoffs and you know, narrower resolution and uh, larger uh, stop bands on the sides. So you can end up getting very extremely selective uh, filters in situations like this. Yeah. Unfortunately, the ones that are programmable are... Typically not that way. Yeah, they're, they're typically yeah. like a, just a single cavity. Yeah, so what's an acousto-optic filter? How does it work? Pardon me? Acousto-optic. Oh, that's, that's what... Uh, acousto-optic. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah, okay, acousto-optic. So it's one of my favorite devices. Um, I'm going okay. to yeah, I'm gonna try to keep myself from going too crazy here. Um, you can always come back next week. So. Yeah, <laughs> I, in fact, I will be back next week, but I hadn't planned for talking. I don't want to steal Robbie's time. That's so cute. Oh, hey, that's a better idea. No, I'm missing it. Oh. Oh, that's oh, that's some, uh, that work. <laughs> All right, so uh, acousto-optics. Um, so you've got some, physic, some some piece of glass, or it's a, it usually not exactly glass, but glass-like substance. Uh, and you, you generally have a piezoelectric transducer here. So, you know, it turns electrical into mechanical motion or vice versa. In this case, we're going to do the, the former. We're going to drive it with some typically RF signal, so, you know, 100 megahertz. If you work with one of these in the lab and try to listen to an FM radio, it gets really annoying. Um, and what this thing does, if you drive it with some, uh, some frequency, is it will generate a traveling wave, which, and this thing's usually built to dump it, on the end, uh, it, it will generate a traveling wave uh, of a pressure wave, a sound wave, inside your device. Um, and any, if you you pass light through this, uh, it will scatter off of that thing, uh, just like any other diffraction grating. All right. I honestly do not know how you do this. I'm familiar with these in like the laser setting. How if you it's do a standing it, wave, then. You yeah. basically look at a standing wave part. Is it a stand? It's yeah. not a standing wave. It's, it's traveling. It's, it's for generally traveling. It has a dominant Even shift. for I don't know. selecting the wavelength? Uh, uh, so the way so. you can okay. select wavelengths with these things is that it's basically a gradient, right? Mm -hmm. So if you imagine uh, one wavelength coming in will go this way, uh, a different wavelength will go that way, and so on. I mean, it's just like any other grading. And then you can simply put an aperture out here, okay. okay? And then by changing the frequency mm -hmm. that you're modul Position. modulating with, you can change the grading okay. period and align different uh, different wavelengths with uh, with your pole and your aperture. So it's basically like a it's basically like your standard grading, except you can tune the uh, in, the period. In in object in object detection media in my group, uh, Dan Smalley, he's actually building these to make uh, holograms. So if you guys want to see, it's like a little. Thing like that, full of ways to get 
to get change yeah. the frequency for well. steering the lasers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. One of my favorite devices. They're really awesome. I'm going to say one more thing just because I, I have to because it's so cool. Uh, uh, as a physicist like myself, you can think of exactly you know exactly how these things work in terms of how much angle you get and uh, it actually shifts the wavelength of the light. Uh, as it does this, so what comes out is not the same as what goes in. And you can figure out all of that if you simply conserve energy and momentum and treat the incoming light as photons with known energy and momentum and treat the sound wave as phonons with known energy and momentum. You do that, it, then it's all just you know the standard physics 101 billiard ball type stuff. It's very cool. Okay. Back on, uh, back on the path here. Uh, yeah, so that, that's that's pretty much our, our baseline scanning filter thing. Any any other questions on on this guy? If you have, this is the simplest enough. possible. Yeah, if you're lost now, you're 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 in trouble. So speak up. Okay, all right. Next one. So our, our second baseline. Um, Ankit also talked about this one. Uh, this is the the standard push broom. This is basically. Uh, very similar to it, just a standard spectrometer. In fact, the, the thing that you are passing around here uh, in the little box is pretty much exactly this. I mean, there's slight differences in how it's, it's made. In the box, big, uh, big thing here. Yeah. So, in that in that box, as you were looking through it, uh, here. yeah, great. Uh, as good. as you're as you're looking through this hole, uh, you see that there is this uh, slit here. Okay, well, put it in the wrong place. A slit there, and you can see it uh, right there. And the slit, <coughs> basically, the the slit is okay, the light is in this sort of architecture. Light is imaged onto the slit. The uh, that light is then made sort of parallel again uh, as it hits the grating. It's spread in different directions now. So the direction of the light is related uniquely to its wavelength. Uh, and then that is refocused on the sensor. So now if we have some flat, uniform scene, what we're going to see on the sensor is vertical stripes, right? exactly like you saw through this thing, it, and where each stripe corresponds to the wavelength. Right? So if you measure how much intensity you get in each of those stripes, you know how much intensity or how much power you have in each wavelength. Now, if the scene has some structure vertically, then the, the structure along a vertical line is related to the object's physical structure vertically. If the object is uniformly dark at the top and bright at the bottom, then that's what you're going to see on the sensor. And the horizontal structure of what you get on the sensor is directly related to the wavelength. That, that's completely it. So you get what this gives you if you have this 3D data cube a single frame of the sensor will give you one solid plane through that data cube, except instead of X and Y, like a normal camera, uh, it gives you X and lambda. Okay? So Y is lost. Y is lost. Or average. Uh, but each way. No, it's, it's, uh, it's not averaged. It's, uh, it's lost. It's, a it's only one point. It's, it's one point, right. Because exactly. it's flipped. Exactly. And so normally what you do in this case is you, you scan it. Right, so you either move the, the camera uh, and take multiple frames at different locations. Or, uh, Anki was completely correct, a lot of these the standard applications are airborne, either for military purposes or for agricultural surveys or, or whatever. So you're flying on an airplane and basically you kind of get the scanning for free. Uh, you just use the airplane to do the scanning. Uh, okay, so... Um, uh, the volume's a little bit bigger, you got more optics. Uh, the, there's no reconstruction here. You're building the data cube up directly. Uh, and uh, the other interesting note is this is also not particularly photon efficient because uh, you, you are getting light from other locations, other, uh, other X values. They're simply being dumped by this slit. That is, if they don't hit the, the, the slit, but hit to either side of the slit, we're throwing the light away. So, so that light is all getting wasted, and so this is also not particularly photon efficient. All right, so now we get into the first wacky version of this. It is also perhaps the most complicated. 
So, sorry, uh, the graceful introduction is over. Uh, so this, architecturally, uh, is completely identical to the thing that you just saw, except we have now replaced the slit with some sort of code. Okay? So now, uh, all of the light that, that gets imaged onto this thing uh, will be modulated by the code, but then everything else is the same. So the, the light gets modulated by the code. You can think of, if you prefer, by the way, if this helps you, you can think of the slit as a particularly boring code. All right? It's a perfectly legitimate code. It's just a really boring one. So this is a more interesting code. Uh, in general, they're going to be you know, half filled and half uh, blocked. Uh, but then all of the usual stuff happens. We, we recollimate, go through the grading, and the, the bits get separated and fall on our sensor. Okay. And we saw earlier the notion of Hadamard multiplexing, where we talked about if you want to take, if you want to measure nine bags, we can measure them one at a time, or we can take random linear combinations and then invert. So this is right. the same concept, right. again done for light. Right. So this device was originally built to be a spectrometer, just like this. All right. So we will conceptually step back for a moment and, and think about it in that context. Don't worry about imaging. Don't worry about x and y. In fact, you can assume that all of the light is maybe hitting a diffuser in front of this thing, for example. So there's no, there's no uh, structure here. So imagine for a moment that this were just some, some interesting spectrum, you know, maybe come from one of these uh, fluorescent lights or, or whatever else, but uh, spatially uniform. Right? The benefit of that is that now, instead of just this single slit through the middle of this thing, now we're collecting a lot more light. We've gone from a factor of... Uh, of you know, one over n or, or one over sorry, one over n y to uh, uh, half, one over two, effectively. All right. So uh, we we modulate this guy, and then now we have this problem. Okay. This is this is the problem in general with uh, the slit. Um, I'm going to back up one more time. What? Why don't we just make the slit bigger if we want to collect more light? Any takers on that? Go for it. Because uh, then you're probably not sampling just one light source that you're interested in. You're probably sampling a larger portion of the scene, which won't give you the specific information you're looking for. Yeah, so, so, so if, if we look at our sensor, uh, if we look at our sensor plane, right, and, and we look at one column of pixels along here, if we have an infinitely narrow slit, we know that this physical location on the sensor is associated with one wavelength, okay? If we now have a wider slit, then this is associated with one wavelength from the left half of the slit, but a different wavelength from the right half of the slit. So now we have this uh, mixing of spatial and spectral information that, uh, that is problematic. Now, the assumption that the whole scene is spatially uniform helps, but that's not generally a realistic assumption. So what this does is help us get around that. So now what we have, because we've coded this, is we have a way of disambiguating uh, this otherwise ambiguous spatial and spectral mixing. So now let's, let's, let's go back. We have this single line on our detector. We, we really do have uh, different spatial locations uh, on our code, on our aperture. Uh, mixing, they're all combining on this column of pixels. Except that this one over here has one wavelength contribution because that bends, say, less. And this one over here is uh, contributing with a different wavelength because that one bends a lot. Right? So what do we do? We take our measured values here and we take the dot product with the appropriate code and these codes, if you've talked about Hadamard codes, for example, are designed so that uh, the dot product of any two mismatched codes will just be zero. And the dot product with the, the single, lonely, correct code is some large value. So what we do is, uh, for this, we take the, the dot product with each of these, and that tells us how much light came through this part of the aperture and landed in this place. And you do that for all of those, and you get to figure out what each of those uh, contributions is, and you can reassemble them. Okay. 
So that's how this thing works as a, as a spectrometer. Now turning it into a spectral imager is just a little bit different. Now we've only got one, we're only trying to make this a push boom spectrometer, so we've only got one spatial degree of freedom that we're trying to recover. And in this case, we're going to actually make that uh, the vertical direction. Is that right? Did I get that right? Uh, scanning wide, no. We're going to make that the, the horizontal direction. Um, because we know how much uh, we've now figured out exactly how much light uh, of each wavelength came through each of these vertical uh, <coughs> columns. <coughs> so we know how much, you know, how much light came from that location and, and what the wavelength of each uh, contribution was. So we're almost there. There's only one remaining problem, and that is if the scene has structure, then that's a problem, right? Our, the the Hadamard code assumes that the, the underlying thing we're trying to reconstruct is smooth, is flat, is unstructured. So the cleverness here comes from the following. We can slide the code vertically and wrap it around at the bottom, right? And take each of those versions where we slide it one, take a frame, slide it again, take a frame, uh, and reassemble them at the end so that you can say, take this, this, um, pick it right here, this spot in this code and look, to what ha look at what happened when it was here, and then look at what happened when it was here, and look at what happened when it was here, and so on. Or equivalently, you can look at this spot on the image and say, what happened when this part of the code was there, then this part of the code was there, and this part of the code was there, and so on. And you can synthesize uh, a, full ver a full frame version of this that is actually using only this row of data over and over and over again. All right, that's horribly unclear, and I apologize, but that's just about the best I can do. The, the point is that you can get past the, the limitations on spatial structure that this uh, spectrometer generally has by scanning this thing in the, the, the Y direction in this case. Uh, and that's okay, because we we're planning on doing that anyway uh, in these uh, push broom architectures. So we do that, we get the, uh, the, the vertical direction, we already had the, uh, the horizontal direction, uh, and so you get the, the two spatial degrees of freedom, and you have your spectrum. Uh, the, the upshot of this guy is it's, uh, it only throws away half the photons, which for these things is actually pretty good, uh, and, and that's pretty much it. There is a little bit of reconstruction. Every point uh, on this thing is actually uh, created by taking a dot product uh, with the code, uh, but that's actually not that bad. So, so this thing's actually a pretty cool system. This is, in some sense, kind of my favorite. And, and again, going back to the comment that Mike made, you know, this can be thought of just as the simplest, the previous one, of a line, which is just a boring code. That's right. And the operation would be identical. You would assume as if you didn't know what the code was. I mean, you didn't know that the code was so simple. And you would still do all the same operations, except now, instead of measuring multiple quantities at the same time, we're actually measuring only one row, I guess? Yeah, so... Only so one row at a time. Uh, yeah, let me, let, me, let me try one more time this way. Um, we... If this thing were... If every column had a uniform value here, we're, we're all pretty confident that this would work, right? The, the Hadamard code... Uh, does a good job of, of allowing us to distinguish how much each column contributed to each column on the sensor, right? So that that tells us for a given column uh, what came from what place in the code and what had what wavelength in the code. So all right, that's pretty straightforward. The only real trick is what happens when it's not vertically uniform and that we can fake. We can fake <coughs> by sliding the, in fact, let's do it this way. This is, a, this is a much easier way to say this. We've got some structured thing here, and we're going to fake just a single frame that has uniform structure vertically. 
How we're going to do that is I'm going to say that we are only interested in this line as we're scanning the object past this thing. When this line is here, I'm going to collect this row, and I'm going to ignore everything else. A moment later, when that line is up here, I'm going to collect this row, and I'm going to ignore everything else, and so on. Do that all the way up, and one step at a time, you construct exactly the frame that you would have if, if the whole thing were uniform with, with this line. So that's how we fake it. Except that we're not doing one line at a time. We're doing the whole thing. You're doing Hadamard multiplex. We're doing Hadamard, exactly. So, so this uh, this guy does a pretty good job, and, and it's pretty. And good. as you'll see over over and over again, this trick is constantly being used of taking linear combination of multiple quantities right. because we want to make the photon efficiency go as close to half as that, possible. That this is a big factor here, the photon efficiency, because the main problem with those two baselines is they both have lousy photon efficiency. All right. Uh, yeah, so that's, I think I've already talked about all of this stuff. So uh, th this is the reconstruction. The scanning options, by the way, we can either uh, move, the, uh, move the scene over the code, like with the airplane moving, or we can circularly scan the code uh, and in a sort of <coughs> snapshotty kind of way. Uh, that is, just point the camera, nothing moves but the code. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so this is uh, out of the same group. So by the way, my, my uh, notation here is the person in parentheses is the, the professor in the group, and the, the name in front is the person who did all the work. Uh, Which would really get the credit. That's right. <laughs> that, that's right. So it's you know, the real person, and then parenthetically, don't forget about this guy. Uh, he paid for it. So... Um, so, so this is a sort of a similar architecture in some ways. Uh, in, in this case, we uh, do the same thing. Uh, well, we don't know. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm back. Uh, uh, I thought I was on the wrong one. So, so this is exactly the same piece of hardware. All right. So, I'm, it's, this is going to take much less time because everything I told you about before uh, is completely true here, except for one thing. Uh, we're not going to move it one line at a time and take every measurement. We're going to take fewer measurements. How many fewer? Eh, it's up to you. So in this case, we know that we don't have enough information to fully reconstruct all of the, the full data queue. So we're going to use some clever algorithmic tricks, uh, and that's where this horrible scaling comes in, uh, to try to reconstruct that full data queue. All right, so you, you guys haven't talked about compressive sensing. I'm going to give you my one minute version of compressive sensing. You have some linear algebra problem here where you've got some big 1D vector and you're going to operate on it with some non-square matrix. Is there an older color? Uh, that would be handy. No? Uh, and I can't erase very well either, so Strange. apologies for that. Uh, let me try this. This is, this is about as complicated as yeah. it gets. So, oh no, dear God. Oh, I thought that yes. What? All right. Uh, all right. So, so this is as complicated as my little diagram gets here. Um, we have some number of parameters that describe a scene. And we have some matrix that is performing an operation on that. Uh, and as a result, we have some number of measurements. If this guy is not square, and in particular, if it is wider than it is tall, then the number of measurements we have uh, is smaller than the number of, object, or number of parameters that fully describe the scene. So this, you know, so, so what, what does this tell us? In a, in a traditional Hadamard multiplexing, it's an exact square matrix. Right. The number of unknowns, the number of knowns is equal. Right. And now we are we have fewer, fewer measurements than unknowns. So even if you don't know anything about the structure of this guy, what 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 do we know from this? I mean, and don't don't think too hard. This is, you know, interlinear algebra. Under constraint problem. Uh, yeah, it's an under under constrained or underdetermined. Right? You know the thing you're capturing on the right. What's that? You know the thing you're already capturing. We do not know it. Okay. That's why we're doing this. <laughs> right. It's the unknown. Yeah, so this is the scene. This is the world. And this is the data that our camera, in this case, spits out. So our, our goal is to, from these measurements, <coughs> figure out what this thing was. 
We do know this matrix. I mean, I'm not, it doesn't matter what the structure is at the moment, but in general, doing these problems, you do know what this matrix is, and you have your measurement, but you're trying to, to get back at this guy. All right, so this is an underdetermined problem, right? And there are many algorithmic approaches to estimating this, uh, and the, you know, there's anybody who's ever used like a, uh, a more Penrose uh, pseudo inverse, you can, you can try and invert this thing, and uh, then with that, this guy will give you an estimate of this. In general, it won't be that good. Um, it depends on the details. But there's this, and, and this, that's as much detail as I'm really going to go into. Uh, there's a relatively new <coughs> discipline called compressive sensing, compressive sensing, which is devoted to finding better ways to, to, to do this. In general, they assume you have control over the nature of this matrix. Uh, but the idea is that you're going to collect far fewer measurements than what you're trying to reconstruct. And the, the basic way that they do that is by using algorithms that assume something about the object. And the thing that they generally assume is sparsity in some domain. So, for example, if you're looking at stars at night, you can assume that compared to the number of pixels, we don't have that many stars. Most of the pixels are black, only a few of them are going to be white. So if you get lots of blurry stuff, you can generally assume that, you know, in a very simple case, in the center of each blur, you've got a single star. Uh, in, in more general imaging applications, you can assume that the object is sparse, say, in the wavelet domain. We don't have white noise, but we've got, you know, nice round faces and you know, eyes and hair and that sort of thing. And uh, if, if wavelets didn't work so well, then we wouldn't be using them for JPEG 2000 and other, other things like that. So if you assume the thing is sparse in some domain, then you can generally do quite a lot better in terms of uh, reconstructing this guy. So that's the basic idea. You design this thing well, uh, and then you reconstruct with these clever algorithms, uh, assuming sparsity to get the original object. Any questions on that really, really fast intro to that was good. compressive sensing? Uh, so, that's where this lousy scaling comes from. Uh, unfortunately, the, the algorithms typically used for compressive sensing are not especially fast. Uh, they scale badly with a number of points. Uh, so what this guy does is, it, it, it using the same hardware we were just talking about, uh, we can take a compressive measurement uh, where we uh, simply don't scan as much as we might like to. The signals get mixed together in a way that we cannot uniquely uh, unscramble them but using these approaches, assuming sparsity and whatnot, we can, we can do a pretty decent job. Um, again, this is a, a good example where I'm not talking about image quality um, because you know, there, there are problems with it. But there's no easy way to characterize it and compare. Okay, uh, let's move on. So this is, a, this is a similar one out of the same group. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this too much. The architecture uh, <coughs> will feel familiar. In this case, uh, we... Image. Let me make sure I get this right. No. So, so we go through uh, like a standard spectrometer, uh, except put our. Now we have our code here, and then we go through a completely identical grading and lens formation to basically uh, remove this uh, wavelength smearing that we had before. So optically. Optically. So, for example, if we just removed this coded aperture and just left it open, left you know nothing in that space then what we would get at the end here would just be a normal picture. That is, this, this grading separates the wavelengths, and this grading puts them back together again. Right? This would do absolutely nothing but take a nice, normal, grayscale picture. What changes things up is that we have this uh, coded aperture in there, and it's, there, it's in there in an interesting place. It's in there where the the uh, spatial and spectral information has been mixed. That is, uh, some wavelengths have been shifted more than others, and so things get all scrambled up and then put back together. So what happens is, and uh, again, maybe we can kill those uh, fluorescents again. Uh, thank you. We, so this is a little bit hard to see, but you have what looks like a relatively normal picture here, except that uh, at, it, at different pixels, you have different uh, codes that have been applied to the spectrum. So, uh, yeah. so, so you can, and again, decode 
uh, on the back end to reconstruct the image. This is also a compressive sensing problem. Uh, it, it's half photon efficient, again, which is going to sound familiar if you hear more about this coded aperture stuff. Uh, uh, because you, you know, roughly half of these guys are closed. It's compressive in that you take a single spatial shot uh, and that's got all of the information you're interested in. So we can compare these guys a little bit um, in terms of how they work. For If we look at the same scene for both of these, and this is intended to be three colors, uh, some red color, some green color, and some blue color with a little bit of overlap in between. Uh, as uh, the, in the single disperser, uh, this thing gets uh, modulated by the mask before any shifting. Uh, in the dual disperser, you shift first and then uh, modulate. And then in the dual disperser, you put things back together. Uh, in the single disperser, you, you modulate and then, and then shift. So this is just sort of giving you a feel for how things are mixed together. Go on to the next one. Some of this, the implications of that are uh, if you have three white uh, sources, in this case, the, uh, the dual disperser, uh, because you split them up first and then modulate, uh, you might lose some of the color bands associated with the single point source. Right? So, so the, the red and green for this point source are just gone. Uh, but the odds are that when you put something back together, all three of those point sources will be represented. Uh, for the single disperser, on the other hand, because the modulation happens uh, first in this uh, in, in the image domain, if if a point source happens to fall on a closed uh, point in the mask, it's just gone. Tough luck. The good news is you do retain better spectral information about the locations you do see. So it's really just kind of a trade-off in terms of uh, what information is higher priority to you and what works better for your application. Uh, last example, same basic thing. You lose spatial structure here, but you get good uh, spectral information. Here, less spectral information, but you still have a better idea of what the, what the spatial structure looks like. All right. What's next? Okay, good. So here's where the, uh, the tomography comes in. So this is uh, another architecture um, that works in a completely different way. The, the, the way this guy works is... Uh, we're going to have some sort of uh, some sort of lens come through our uh, our imaging system, collimate the light, and then go through a diffraction grating. Okay. Now this is a, a specially created uh, diffraction grating that scatters in many different two-dimensional directions. So, uh, yeah. So, well, y yes and no. It's uh, uh, it's. Well, yeah, it's hard to say exactly. Um, yeah, it's like three, four, I five. I think it's six directions, right. but then you get combinations. So this, this is a, this one here is a combination of this and, and that, and this, this is two orders of this thing. So this one, these six around here are the first orders of diffraction. Um, Can we show the same effect with this? Okay, yeah. So, so think of one of these as this guy here. So if you shine light at this, you'll get a smear. And as you rotate this guy, these yeah. guys, other guys will show. And at so this orientation, this one. But imagine if there are finer gratings that will smear even more. Actually, what, so I think that what this is physically is... So you take, yeah, I'll pass this around in just a moment. If you took three of these guys, mm -hmm. rotated them each 120 degrees from each other, this is basically what you would get, right? So this is the scattering off of one of them. Go for it. We have a, oh, hey, good. Oh, I can, I can, I can do better than that. Look here. No, what, you just have monochromatic? Yeah, that's, that's true. But you can get the idea of okay, the good, multiple perfect. orders here, okay. right? So, um, so one of these, that one, is my zero order uh, beam through this diffraction grating. The middle one here. And, and, and each of them going farther One, out. two, three, minus one, minus two, minus exactly. three. Right. So what we're looking at here, if we just had one of these guys, we'd have zero, one, two. And the, the one and two are just nudging into each other. That's It looks like one long one, but it's actually two. So 
0, 1, 2, negative 1, negative 2. So this is 1, 2 from a grating at this kind of angle. Uh, this is almost certainly uh, 1 from this and 1 from the grating that's at this angle. So you get these, uh, these multiple gratings all on the same material, and you get this sort of scattering in different angles. We can pass that around if people care to look at it again. Um, so, and again, if you just look at the world through this, and you, you rotate, you'll see that the copies are shifting. That's right. So, all right, now here's where the magic happens. What good does this do us, <laughs> right? So what, think about what it means to smear these wavelengths and then uh, let that light fall on a camera or on a sensor. Right? We don't have just a single uh, you know, unidirectional beam here, but we have an image. Right? We, have, uh, we have a scene that's being propagated through this thing. And if we imagine the scene has multiple colors or multiple wavelengths, as you know, it, it must if we're interested in it, uh, then what's going to happen is, say, the, a blue wavelength part of the scene and a red wavelength part of the scene, which started out on top of each other, are going to get shifted and added together on the sensor. Okay, so if we if we imagine uh, the red, uh, let me let me do this. Okay, we can maybe turn the lights back on for a moment. Uh, imagine this is the a red layer, and now I'm going to take the blue layer. It's going to be shifted and added together, right? These two things are, are going to be shifted with respect to each other and added together. That's another way to think about that. Um, I'm going to draw my data cube here, which I've been talking about. And oh, I love to draw. There we go. Okay. Um, if this is x, y, and lambda, what does a normal uh, monochrome camera do? Right? It gives us a value. So, so I'm representing the scene here. Right? Uh, a normal monochrome camera gives us the integral vertically through lambda uh, of that scene. Okay? It just takes up uh, take, takes all of the different values at every different lambda, adds them all together, just gives us the total amount of power for all wavelengths in the scene. What our shift now does is it gives us the integral along some line at some non-vertical angle. Which is the same concept as the light field for assignment two. Yeah. Shifting so, and adding. So, uh, so for a single... So if we measure this out here, for example, what we're getting is a full image made by many line integrals at some angle through this data cube. Right? And now if we measure this one way out here on the edge where things have been shifted a lot in the other direction, that we get some very steep line integrals in the other direction. Okay? Now, if this is starting to feel like tomography, it should, right? Because that's effectively exactly what we're doing here. We are taking many line integrals through this through this data cube at many different angles, and we can use standard tomographic techniques to, to <laughs> reconstruct them. Let's just make sure everybody's uh, with that one. Yeah. Do you see the analogy between X-ray tomography and what we have done here? The wacky thing is that this is no longer a head or some physical three-dimensional object, right? It's no longer x, y, and z that are three dimensions in this case. It's x, y, and it, lambda. It's x, y, and lambda, okay? And our path integrals are no longer density, but they're just the amount of energy represented by that x, y, and lambda voxel, all right? Mathematically, completely identical, right? We're just taking path integrals through at a bunch of different angles, we get enough of them, we can reconstruct that entire data cube. And if you have, say, 
we forgot how many was it? 25 here, roughly? Oh, yeah. Let's say you have 25 such arrows here that corresponds to what in, in an X-ray tomography? Angles. It corresponds to 25 angles. As if you put X-ray in position 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. <laughs> Yeah. One, two, three, four, whatever. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And you basically took those 25 projections. And that's exactly what this is. Which also means, in terms of resolution, what's going on here? In terms of your sensor resolution. You're losing resolution by at least by a factor of 25. Usually much more because you cannot pack these guys very tightly. Right. right, yeah. So that's that's one of the problems with this architecture is this is the sensor, right? This square box is the sensor. Uh, and you can get some, you know, 12, 14 megapixel sensor and throw a lot of pixels at this thing, but you're wasting a lot of them. No light's ever falling on them. And that's because you got to make sure that these don't overlap with each other. That's a real problem. Uh, so it, as a result, you end up with dead space in between. Uh, well, it's a very clever yeah. scheme. It's a very clever scheme. Uh, when you think about how tomography principle is being used for hyperspectral right. right. All right, go, uh, go ahead. Uh, let's, let's stop here because we are running over time. Uh, and yeah. and uh, let's see if there are any questions on, on that. And then you're going to be here next week, right? Uh, so I am. Actually, just, just do me a favor. Just flip through to remind me what's left, and I'll see if I have any, any uh, comments. I'm we not going to talk too much about yours. Right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, no. That, that, that's a summary table. Yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. Be good to summarize it at the beginning yeah. of this. Okay, I could do that. That's yeah. Fine. Uh, it's yeah, yeah. yeah, fair enough. Are there any questions on the on the the deck or what do you call it? The the last one. Oh, the discard. Yeah, discard. Yeah, yeah, the discard. Yeah, the is the name of it. Yeah. The summary table one. Yeah. So the only one we didn't get to was ISIS. Lovely. So they're, they're, yeah, th this is very similar to CETIS, so that's not so interesting. ISIS and then the Agile Spectrum, which uh, Anka talked about a little bit. Yeah. Well, a lot. Actually, more than I will. I'm going to talk about it a little bit. So these, uh, I'll just say, these two aren't traditional hyperspectral or spectral <coughs> imagers. Uh, the goal there two. is not measuring the cube, the traditional cube. That's right. So all of these are the images that your company developed or? No, no, no. This is a survey of uh, academic literature. Okay. So, um, that in fact, together we, this uh, we did, uh, uh, Rourke did work on something that sort of could be a, a light field architecture that could be used as a, a spectral imager. I, uh, that didn't even get in here. I presented it a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you've seen it other ways. You better remember. <laughs> <laughs> so, your assignment number four is multispectral imaging. And uh, we won't build building hardware because that takes too long. Uh, but we'll give you a data set that has 32 channels, 10, micro, 10 microns each, mm -hmm. for flowers and people and beer and, and so on. And then we'll do something like what Ankit was saying, where instead of using standard RGB um, um, color response, you will be allowed to mix and match those spectrums and create interesting images. So this should be a relatively simple assignment because you're simply adding up this 32 images and creating the three-channel image yes. at the end. But hopefully it will get you uh, intrigued about how different things look uh, in different spectrum. So uh, the assignment number four is actually open-ended. This is just a suggestion. If you want to do something very simple, something that takes no more than six hours to do, propose to me as well. Uh, we we can support that as your fourth assignment. Or if you don't want to think too much, then you can just do this one and focus your creative energy towards the final project. So next week we have, uh, we'll be talking more about uh, scientific imaging, microscopy, tomography. We, we did it in a slightly opposite sequence. We wanted to do the tomography first, but hopefully now you already have some idea, uh, deconvolution uh, and so on. Um, that's what we'll talk about next week. Um, and we also have a, a, a guest speaker. And then uh, we'll do a very brief overview for the exam on the 13th, uh, which is open book, open laptop, open everything. So you don't have to study for it. You should really be focusing on your final project.